Hi guys, I'm Mar. So today we are back with my little get ready and let's just spill some tea. Let's just talk about different things. And last week I did a video where I did the rise and fall of Victoria's Secret and you guys seem to really enjoy that and I definitely enjoyed it. So I was like, you know what? Let's do another one of these because I really wanted to talk about the rise and fall of the beauty guru. Maybe that's something weird. It's not really like a company because I said I really wanted to talk about companies, but it's something that lately I've just been thinking a lot about so I'm just gonna dive into that I did some research so I have all my facts straight but of course I mean with beauty gurus there's gonna be some opinion in here so feel free to leave your opinions and I'm gonna drop all the products I'm using in the description box I have a look that I want to do but I'm not 100% sure on how it's gonna turn out cuz <laughs> I'm not a beauty guru I'm just a makeup enthusiast <laughs> So I hope it turns out good. But anyhow, I've posted these videos both times on a Thursday. So I feel like there's almost like a like tea Thursday. <laughs> Spill the tea Thursday. Mm. So anyway, beauty gurus, the inception. So the beauty industry and beauty tutorials started with this woman. Her name was Adrienne. Adrienne K. Nelson. At least from what we can tell, maybe there was someone else who was hosting makeup videos before Adrienne. But as far as what we know, Adrienne posted this video in 2006 on how to look hot in five minutes or less. And I'm just like here for that, Adrienne. Yes, I want to look hot. I don't got a lot of time. So that is just great. That's the type of video we want and we need in our lives. You guys might be like, well, who is Adrian? How can I follow her? And Adrian was smart. She posted four videos and then she was like, you know what? Never mind. I'm out. I'm going back to my regular life. This is weird. This YouTube stuff is just not for me. This whole talking to the camera. Good. She pulled a Chantal on 90 Day Fiancé on this. She was just like, bye. But around that time, 2007, 2008, was when the first generation of beauty gurus appeared. And I've divided this into four different generations. And this is just me. Of course, there's like no literature on the beauty guru generations. But I'll make a point for every generation. And I think it's safe to divide them into these four generations. So 2007, 2008 was the time of the first generation. And that was the time of the Lauren Luke's, the makeup geeks marlena also michelle fawn around this time it was just about makeup and makeup application just that well and mac cosmetics i mean if you were not talking about mac cosmetics you were just uncool and you could not sit with us i mean it was so much so about mac cosmetics literally everyone was obsessed with mac that marlena started her makeup geek company by selling mac samples in smaller containers so it would be cheaper and more affordable so people like someone maybe like me although not really because i couldn't even afford her small samples but people who just couldn't afford mac or wanted to try something and didn't want to shell out the money for the full size they could just go ahead and purchase it from her and try it out which honestly i've always thought marlena is so smart and she definitely had such a big role in this industry and she is not that woman if you know what i'm talking about you know and if you don't know then maybe somebody in the comments will tell you but there was also a lot of focus on celebrity makeup so how do we create different looks from a different celebrities and it was not really a personal thing it was just i'm here i'm gonna show you this technique and that's it we didn't know too much about these people they didn't post every day just maybe once or twice a week and that was okay that was all we needed you know but then around 2009 2010 second generation rolls around so when second generation rolls around this is more the l fowlers blair fowlers which if you guys remember those were not their real names and that was the biggest drama at the time how dare they use fake names on the internet these people were real and how could they lie about about their names. I mean, if we only knew what was coming, right? So both Blair and Elle actually started with Mac related videos. So Mac was still the biggest thing. Bethany Moda, whose screen name was actually Mac Barbie 07. So Mac was everywhere. Mac just seemed to not be going anywhere. And now that I'm thinking of it, maybe we should do a rise and fall video for Mac cosmetics because they are just not what they used to be. So Ingrid Nielsen, Soella, and around this time was also what I would consider the rise. Of Michelle Fawn. So Michelle is key in this story not only because she gave us amazing videos and we all love Michelle but also because she's to blame for an entire generation of gurus. Spoiler alert. And I don't really know if the word is to blame because I mean it's great. It's great that she supported women and she gave women a platform but I feel like a lot of people don't even realize this. They don't realize that Michelle Fawn had so much to do with the current beauty world that we know. They're just like oh Michelle Fawn I forgot that she even existed. 
existed. If people even knew she existed, because I know a lot of people don't remember her from like back in the day. I of course remember Michelle. Her Barbie makeup transformation has 68 million views. And around that time when that video was launched, videos would have like 100,000 views. They wouldn't have millions of views. It's not like it is now. So that only speaks to the really big reach that Michelle had. This was also the time for her bat romance look. And that was crazy because she included like little special effects where she made her eyes really big and everyone was just like, oh my God, I'm shook. I can't believe this is happening in a YouTube video out of all places. I mean, and this second generation started to be a little bit more about lifestyle. So they started doing more hauls and favorites and doing room tours and just in general talking about their lives. So it wasn't so much about the artistry anymore, but it was also about the person. So you would start to get this connection with the person. You would come home from school or whatever, and you will watch these people living the life that was very similar to yours. And you would really feel like they were your friends and they would recommend products and you would go and buy them. And there will be products that you love because the things they talked about were real. Around this time, creators were popular, but it wasn't so popular to have brand deals or to be making a lot of money. I mean, YouTube monetization was just getting started. And when a creator would take a brand deal, it was a big deal. And sometimes the audience would even get mad at them. They would be like, how dare you betray us like this? Which is so different from what it is nowadays. But that would happen because the relationship would just be so close and so personal. So 2011, and rolls around and Michelle Phan is like, I'm a businesswoman. I'm not going to be a YouTuber forever. I'm not going to be sitting here doing deals with Lancome and people getting angry at me. Oh, hell no. I'm going to go and I'm going to start my own company. And Michelle starts this little company, which you guys might know, named Ipsy. So Ipsy was this subscription service where you would get each month a little bag and the bag would have different makeup products. And this was like all the rage because you would pay like $20, I think it was. And then you would just get like random products that would be a lot more than what you paid for. And nowadays that sounds like something that's completely normal. But back then that was something that was so new and people were so into it. They would sign up and every month you would have a little bag and then you have all these bags that you were supposed to be able to reuse, but nobody ever really reused them. And I feel like the most genius part of Ipsy was one, there was a waiting list. And two, you did not know what you were about to get in your bag. So if you wanted to A, skip the waiting list or B, know what you were going to get in your bag, you you had to share on social media. So you had to blast 10 of your friends on Facebook and tell them go join Ipsy because I need to skip this waiting list. And also if you want to see what products you were going to get, you had to follow the Ipsy stylist on different platforms. So around this time, there was this little known thing that was just starting out that people were like, oh, this seems cool by the name of Instagram. <laughs> Does that sound familiar to any of you guys? So you had to follow all these stylists on Instagram, on YouTube, even on Facebook, you had to follow them to know what you were going to get on your Ipsy bag. And that's how I believe the third generation of the beauty guru was born. Some of these Ipsy stylists included Desi Perkins, Kristen Dominique, Katie Lester looks, Crispy. There's a lot of people that are well-known names now that started by being Ipsy stylists. And Ipsy would grab people that were just starting out that did not have a following because, I mean, between you and me, they gave them a pretty shady contract and these were people that were just, you know, growing their following. So it would benefit them because even Ipsy's president said in an interview in 2015 with entrepreneur.com, she said that people would see their following skyrocket. So it'd be worth it for them to join Ipsy to skyrocket their following and then grow their personal brands from there. It was kind of like beauty guru school started by Michelle Phan because at the time she was the biggest beauty guru. So what she was doing was just having all of her audience also go and connect with these new people. So around this time, I would say it was a pretty good time. I didn't get to experience this like amazing beauty guru world just because, I mean, I was in Venezuela. <laughs> Things are different there. But Instagram was starting to grow and people were starting to use social media a lot more. So they were starting to follow different creators and they were starting to follow the beauty gurus and they were just starting to see people and they were like, oh wow, I love this girl. I love how she does her makeup. I love this. I love that. And the connection was just a lot closer because it was no longer one or two videos a week. You were seeing these people every day. So they were posting pictures every day on different makeups and different looks and you start to feel a connection to them. You know, you start 
to feel close and be like, wow, these are my friends. Now, Instagram wasn't always positive. It wasn't all good because it was very, very polished. So that's when we saw the rise of the famous Instagram makeup, which was just a whole lot of makeup. I mean, it was layers on top of layers on top of layers because everything was just supposed to be very polished, very clean, skin smoothing, filter, everything that we know to be kind of a staple of the beauty industry was born, I would say, with this third generation. So people were feeling closer to these creators. And since there was an easier access, you could see more of them. Creators started to get a bigger following and brands started to realize. They started to see the potential in these creators and also on social media platforms for their own brands. So brands started to use social media and curate their own personal Instagrams to have them match whatever their brand identity would be. And they could find different people to work with that will also match with whatever they wanted. I would say this generation so far has been the longest and it's when we saw this Instagram perfect life and for a while there everyone wanted that. Everyone wanted that Instagram perfect life. Everyone saw these creators and they were like wow whatever they have I want. I want to be their friend. I want to hang out with them and if you couldn't hang out with them then you wanted whatever product they were recommending because it was so cool. It was something that you were like it's gonna give me the life that they have. Basically, it was all FOMO and brands were really smart and they were like, ooh, we can make a lot of money from people's FOMO. Also, since there was more involvement from brands, the content changed. So the content wasn't about technique anymore. It was more about the products. It was more about reviews. If it was a get ready with me, it was more of a chit chat get ready with me. It wasn't about explaining so much what you were doing because at a certain point, the audience got to a point where they had already seen videos about the technique and they wanted to know more about the product and the brands were so eager to show off their products. So it was just an ideal scenario where what the consumer wanted was also what the creator was showing them. And I would say there was a point there where there was balance. However, of course, all good things must come to an end and it kind of just went a little bit overboard. So consumption just changed a lot and people got to the point where they were full on stockpiling products. They just saw that their favorite favorite creators had rooms full of makeup. And I mean rooms where they had like drawers and drawers just like up to the ceiling with makeup, which honestly no person would ever need. But they saw that and they were like, wow, that is the dream. That is what I want to achieve because I love this person and I admire this person and their life is a life that I want. So maybe I can't be their friend. Maybe I can't have their life, but you know what? I can have a room full of makeup. So they started buying products like crazy, maybe products that they didn't really need. Maybe they didn't necessarily need 20 shades of red lipstick. I will say though, I love makeup, so I might need like at least 10 shades of red lipstick because there is a difference. But I will say also, it can be a little bit too much. I mean, if you have so much makeup that you're never ever gonna use and that you think you're gonna use it, because I understand wanting to just have it or just like a souvenir, like something that was limited edition. Like I have the Game of Thrones collection and I just have it like saved because I love the show and I love that collection. And that's okay. I mean, you're allowed to have like your hobbies and things that you like to hold on to. But when you have things that are just there and you don't even know that they're there, just for having it, I feel like that might be an issue. But the point is that there was a lot of consumption happening with the idea that if you had the product, you were gonna be like the person. And the best example of this is Kylie Jenner. So November 30th, 2015, Kylie Jenner releases her lip kits. And Kylie released her lip kits after saying these lip kits were the reason why she had her amazing lips and that, you know, she just could never find the perfect shade for her lipstick and her lip liner. So she made the solution happen and everyone just wanted Kylie's lips. If you guys also remember, this was the time of the lip filler. It was also the time where cosmetic procedures were just happening left and right. And it was normal. It was something that just happened because the look that was in style was kind of like this Brad doll kind of look where everything was very exaggerated. A big lash, big lip, dark liner, heavy contour. It was just a lot of excess. So Kylie released her lip kits and also something that people were really doing around this time was collabs. And I feel like this was the age of the collab. People didn't really have their own brand. It was more about collabing with other brands. And this was great because just five years earlier, brands 
found it very hard to work with people that were not in traditional media. So now you can have someone that was at their house and like doing their makeup and for whatever reason, people wanted to follow them and all of a sudden they could have a collab with an amazing brand and be really, really successful, which in the past would have been pretty much impossible. And I feel like most beauty gurus have kind of stuck to their generation, except Nikki Tutorials. So Nikki actually started in 2008. So that will make her first generation, but she didn't really become very well known or like the Nikki tutorials we know nowadays until 2015, which is when she released The Power of Makeup, which is where she did half her face. And that's when Nikki really blew up, sort of say. And I remember because I followed Nikki literally since 2008 and I always felt she was very underappreciated. So when she blew up, I was just very happy for her because I felt that she deserved all the recognition. And I was just very proud of her because she is a true artist and she creates amazing looks. So anyway, thanks for were great. I mean, we were all wearing probably a bit too much bronzer, but we were happy. Our lashes were too big, but it was fine. Our lips were definitely overlined, but everything was happy. You know, everything was good. People were starting to make a lot of money because brands were starting to realize that consumers, we were just going to go on Instagram to see the information about a product or go check a YouTube video. It was no longer about what the brand said, but more about what information we could see online. So brands started to put their money in to social campaigns. But in my opinion, and you guys tell me what you think, because I struggled with this. I was trying to remember, but I feel like people were making money, but they weren't showing it off. This wasn't a time where people were like, oh, look at my Lamborghini or whatever. They were just, maybe you would see them with like a nice bracelet or something. And you would be like, hmm, wow, that's nice. But they wouldn't be like, oh, private jet tour. And if they showed something that was expensive, I feel like they were very appreciative. It was just a different way to show wealth. Not like now where it's just sitting and like Louis Vuitton pajamas and you're like, is that necessary? I don't, mm. not to shade anyone's pajamas. I mean, I sleep in the nude. <laughs> No, not really. I sleep in Gordo's t-shirts. But anyway, 2015 rolls around and this is gonna be a little controversial, just like this entire generation. So 2015 rolls around and with it comes the drama generation. That's what I've decided to call it because that's the only thing that's happened recently. So I'm gonna say this and you guys feel however you wanna feel because this is a very polarizing issue. But in 2015 enters a new player and this new player is Jeffree Star. Jeffree, Jeffree, Jeffree. So Jeffree Star has, of course, been around the internet forever. I mean, he was known in MySpace for his music and he had his makeup brand, but he decides to start creating YouTube content, like serious content where he starts to upload frequently at the end of 2015. And by 2016, he has his first scandal with Kat Von D. Then 2017, second scandal with Nikki Tutorials and Too Faced. 2018, Grammageddon 1 with Manny and MUA and Laura Lee and then 2019, how can we forget? James Charles, Tati, and Dramageddon. So basically every day is a day for drama in Jeffrey's life. And you guys might be like, but why? Mar, why? Why would he be doing that? I'm sure it's just bad luck. You know, a lot of people have bad luck in this life and I agree. But also if I had to answer your question as to why, there is a why. And the why is money. Money, money, money. So much money, honey. By 2019, the beauty industry was valued in 532 billion dollars billion with a B. Kylie only got one of those billions. So there's plenty of billions to go around and plenty of people who want just a few billions, you know, casual. I don't even know what you do with a couple billions. Like, what do you do? Why would somebody need that much money? Why would somebody even need a single billion? Like what you gotta buy? How many planes you need? How many places you going? I feel like there's not even enough places on this planet for you to go to. You don't need that much money. You really don't. But anyway, people want that money. The beauty industry truly was no longer about beauty. It was about money. It was this big juicy pie, like those Lancome juicy tubes from back in the day. And everyone wanted a piece. And by the time the drama generation came around, they knew this. They knew that the more controversy you had, the more attention you would get. And the more attention you have, the more money you have. 
And also with every one of these controversies, the focus shifted. It was no longer about beauty. It was about these people's lives and what the problem was. Who was against who? Who had drama with who? You really didn't care what color their eyeshadow was or what primer they were wearing. You were just thinking, ooh, what's the tea this morning? And I think this is just me on a personal note, that that was entertaining for a little while, that people were like, ooh, now it's not just beauty, we get like a little extra something which is fun until the veil was pulled from everyone's eyes because people just thought that all of this drama were just problems that people like them had. People like you and me had these problems and we we're just like, oh, looking at a friend arguing with someone else and we maybe took a side. We felt empathy for them. But then in 2018, makeup geek Marlena, who you guys might remember from Generation One, she made a video where she talked about how much some of these creators charged to talk about a product, or she even said to talk bad about a product, which personally I've never heard of, but she said this. And she threw around the number $60,000. And she just threw that number around saying that everyone was charging at least $60,000 which is a huge number. I mean, I'm sure people get paid that much, but it's definitely not what most people get paid. And she threw that number and people just assumed that's what every creator would get paid for 10 seconds of their time to talk bad about a product. And she also said a lot of other things, which are true, that make creators look really bad. And I don't blame her. I mean, there's a lot of really bad creators and people who are just bad people. But that video was kind of the beginning of us waking up and realizing these are millionaires. These are not people like normal people. These are millionaires that are out here crying over vitamins, over a teenager, not talking about vitamins. Excuse me. I mean, I got real things to deal with. It just seemed so silly. The enjoyment wasn't there anymore. It was just gone because why do you care about these people? They don't care about you. They are not your friend. They're just using you to make those $60,000. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that's definitely how I felt. And that was the sentiment I saw online. Line. I just felt like, oh, I'm just kind of like a random number, like a random piece in this game that they're playing and I'm not a part of, even though I was made to feel like I was. Also, by this time, social media was just a much bigger deal. There was a lot more people who were coming and being a part of the beauty industry. People who maybe just didn't care as much, who didn't really love the products, who just wanted to see something quick and just kind of be done with it. But whenever there was some drama, they would pop back up and be involved in it. And those people are still people. Those people are still equally as valuable. I know some people who love beauty like to be like, oh, whatever, we don't care about them. But you have to care because now, since there was a lot more people looking at what was happening in the beauty industry, traditional media also got involved. And the power of traditional media was huge. James Charles is actually the best example of this because James Charles actually got his start in a way, thanks to traditional media, because he got a huge boost from being the very first cover boy. So, you know, cover girl, they had a cover boy nationally, national campaign, national media, traditional media, talking about him all the way back in 2016. And people loved him. He was this cute kid who was a boy who wore makeup. He was likable. And people were just obsessed with James, especially the younger audience. But then from one minute to the next, people hated James and people jumped on the hate train. And I mean, I don't need to bring up the memories from Dramageddon 1 and I don't need to bring up the memories from Dramageddon 2 because that was just a whole mess. But basically people could love you and then all of a sudden they didn't like you anymore. Also, I think consumers, we were just tired. We were just like, why am I going to believe anything this person says? We can't even believe them when they're talking about their friend. How am I going to believe when they're talking about a product to someone like me? These are not people like me. They are not my friends. So I'm just going to do my own research. And people were just tired of this idea of the beauty guru. And I feel like the beauty guru got a really bad reputation. And really who is to blame for this? We are to blame for this because the truth is that drama sells. If we watch a video that we don't like and we dislike it, we're still helping this creator have exposure because we're still interacting with this video. And if we're interacting with this video or this picture or we're talking about this person, even if we're talking about this person to say that we disagree with what they're doing, we're still talking about this person and they're happy because that means that their numbers are still going to go up, that if they have a brand, they're still going to be able to sell products and open 
overall, they're good. Because around this time and the times that we live in now, we have algorithms. So it wasn't any more about, oh, let me just find a video and try and see a cool video. It's more about what the algorithm is recommending you. And if you interact with something, whether it's for a good or for a bad thing, the algorithm will still be like, oh, she liked this. Let me just go ahead and make sure I recommend this to someone else. And that's why there's more and more drama and drama channels. Now, are all creators like this? Because I think everyone that's even, ooh, that's even slightly into beauty has this reputation now that they're dramatic or that they do bad things or that they don't have good intentions behind them. And honestly, the answer is no. Most creators are not like this. There's been such a growth in the internet as a whole, not only in the beauty community, that there's so many creators, especially small creators, and so many of them really are normal people and really have the best intentions and they don't have all these mansions and jets and whatever all these things might be. But people don't find them. They don't get exposed to them because there's all of this noise from all these other people who are just taking up so much of the space and all these recommendations from this algorithm that it's a really, really big struggle to have your content be found nowadays. So basically, these big creators that are really not what people want, that are something that people are have just become detached from, that are tired from, that are just... <sighs> Like really, they're giving out this notion that everyone is dramatic and that everyone is bad when I truly believe that's not the case. But I also understand that it's hard to find people that just seem good and just seem normal. However, I do think that is going to change because I do think that we are just becoming more educated, that we are understanding more what is happening on social media because social media is still very new. So it's understandable that we had to go through like this kind of rough patch to understand that yes, there's some people who have a really big following, but maybe those are not the people that I should be following. Maybe those are just not the people for me. And people are becoming more and more educated. They are understanding more what sponsorships look like. They're understanding more when a creator works with a product. That doesn't mean that they are selling you something that they don't like or that they don't believe in. Because I feel like there was a point where there was a lot of distrust where people just thought that anything that was sponsored meant that it was bad. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that sponsorships can be a very good thing because they can help creators that are just starting out or creators that just want to do this who really can't live off AdSense because it's very difficult to live off only AdSense to be able to do it and be able to have good quality, have good content and just be able to actually be here and do the research and be here for us. So I think we'll just be smarter and buy products that really resonate with us, buy products from people that we really connect to and not just be like, oh, I need to have this because I have like a stockpile in my room because <laughs> I do think those times are over. But in a way, I'm kind of happy because I feel like it'll be the time for a new creator to rise. It'll be the time for a creator that's more genuine in a way. A creator and a beauty guru who's more kind of tailor-made, who connects more with you, with your age group, with your tastes. Maybe we should call it the rise of the small creator. Hopefully, YouTube will stop hiding amazing small creators because I think the best creators are small creators, personally. But yeah, that's my take on it. I don't know what you guys think. I would love to know. So let me know and let me know if you would like to see another one of these videos and what this show will be about. And yeah, I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!